My name is Howard J. Ehrlich. I was uh, born in a log cabin in Brooklyn, New York. I came to uh, anarchism in a strange way. I was at a peace rally when a group of people waving a black flag ran up to the lectern, yelled some things that were incomprehensible and left. And I turned to the person I was with and I said, what was that? He said, those, those were the anarchists. I said, who are they? And he said, you mean you don't know Marx and Bakunin? I said, Marx and Bakunin? I was embarrassed. I said, no, I didn't know. I never heard of Bakunin. Uh, and he said, their correspondence is famous. And so I ran to the library to look for the Marx and Bakunin correspondence, and there wasn't any. <laughs> but in the process, I had read an awful lot of anarchism and decided, hey, there was something to this. And that's sort of how I came to anarchism. Great. As an anarchist, I think my major work has been in the later years, I'm in my later years, uh, a writer and an editor. I've edited several anthologies and uh, am the editor of uh, the magazine of social anarchism. Earlier, I was uh, strongly involved in the peace movement, um, the Vietnam War. Uh, I was a regional traveling organizer for a while. Um, and I helped uh, organize what was the national organization called the New University Conference, one of the more anonymous but really powerful organ anti-war organizations. That's all I think I was. That wasn't very articulate. Oh, that's fine. We, we, we also can edit. Add one more thing. Okay, just, just a second. The mic. Camera? Okay. I have, in my work as an anarchist, never been able to forget, nor did I want to, that I trained as a sociologist and social psychologist. And the reason why I mention that is that no matter what I look at from a political standpoint, I'm also looking at as a social scientist. And so I have a very different view, I think, of both social science and anarchism. <clears throat> the best way I can talk about combining an anarchist perspective with a social science perspective is to talk about what it is, I think, a radical social scientist ought to be doing. Um, I think we can still go about the process of testing hypotheses and building theories, but we have to understand that we're building theories for a reason, and that reason is, is to build a new and better society. And so as a sociologist, what I want to do is to test propositions that confirm or disconfirm our way about building a new society. <coughs> we compiled Reinventing Anarchy um, as a means of introducing people to the various dimensions of anarchism. And I, I think we did a good job. Uh, we sold several thousand copies of the of the book. But to me, the thing that was uh, and is most intriguing is about 10 years later, we decided to put out a new edition and not to use things that were more than, not to use articles that were more than 10 years old so that it would still be quite contemporary. In fact, 80% of the second anthology was new. But the interesting thing about it from a, a political standpoint is that they were very different books. That um, the reinventing anarchy again, which we called it, 
was deadly serious, whereas reinventing anarchy was fun. That if you look at the two books side by side, uh, you'd see that there were all these cartoons, flyers, um, clever little pieces. If you look at reinventing anarchy again, uh, there was the humor was gone, and it and it reflected the times. The, the first in the late sixties, and the second ten years ten years later, and anarchism had couldn't escape the change in the times from the anti-war activities, uh, the mass organizations like SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, the New University Conference, Science for the People. All of these came together uh, with great humor and good propaganda. Subsequently, uh, the propaganda is still there, if you want to call it, which I think we can, uh, but the humor isn't. And uh, I felt there was nothing we could do about it. We were trying to represent the field, uh, and that's the way it, it stood. When I would tell people who asked, uh, what is anarchism, they'd often laugh. How, how, can you, how can you be an anarchist? Anarchists have no organization and you're one of the more organized people I know. And I tried to tell them that one of the things about anarchism is that it is a theory of organization. In fact, I argue that anarchism is a theory of organization, a theory of radical social change, and a personal philosophy. And people have a great deal of difficulty comprehending that. In fact, I'll tell you a story. Um, I was doing some contract research on grants uh, with the National Endowment for the Humanities in the state of Maryland. And the head of the office had found out that I was an anarchist. And she asked uh, what it was. And I, I gave her a copy of the magazine. About a month later, I hadn't heard anything about it. Uh, I asked her assistant, what about the magazine? And she said, oh, so-and-so. Uh, never read it. And it turned out that she started to read it the day I gave it to her on the bus and decided that people were staring at her. So she put it away. And every time she took it out, she had this <laughs> delusion that people were staring at her. <laughs> the, uh, finally, she hid it in the house, her house, because she was sure her husband would find it and he would be very angry. And so she returned it to me via her assistant without ever reading it. And I've had that similar reaction uh, over the years. Uh, of course, people always want to uh, joke about anarchism and organization. Uh, and when they see that I'm serious about it, uh, they usually terminate the conversation. Okay. I think it's important to look at the various components of this ideology, this set of beliefs we call anarchism. And one is to understand that it's a, it's a way of life. That anarchism is a way of life. It's a way in which we deal with people um, in terms of how we live, uh, in terms of uh, violence and nonviolence, uh, in in terms of um, stop that. <laughs> Let me start that over. I believe that I have to, and in any anarchist has, has to put together anarchism as a way of life, uh, understand it as a theory of organization. And as a theory of organization, 
people often have a great deal of difficulty with it because the stereotype of anarchism is, of course, chaos, uh, not to mention violence. So when you begin to talk to someone who is naive to the area, those are the two things that come up. How, how can you be serious, uh, given the violence that anarchists have manifest? And often they'll point to uh, Berkman and Goldman, uh, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. Uh, Berkman, who thought by assassinating one of the big capitalists of the day, that this would motivate people uh, to uh, join in the anti-capitalist movement. He was, of course, mistaken. This was not the way to go. Then there was the anarchist who shot McKinley. Uh, and so th these remain, these are sort of the iconic symbols uh, of anarchism, iconic from the standpoint of, uh, of people who are re rejecting the idea. Um, when I talk about anarchism as a theory of organization, I let people know that hierarchy and the absence of hierarchy uh, are theories of organization themselves, and that nobody laughs when you talk about um, anarchist, when you talk about organization from an anarchist standpoint, but um, they can't conceive, they simply can't conceive of a group, of an organization, of a city being run on non-hierarchical principles. Note in the uh, ed recent Egyptian uh, struggle, uh, none of the commentators talked about this, that none of the commentators, except maybe Al Jazeera, I'm not sure about them, None of them talked about this as an anarchist-like uprising. Uh, here was a spontaneous uprising. It was a, an uprising that tried to maintain a nonviolent perspective. Um, but anarchism was written out of the dialogue. I maintain that the central concept of anarchist theory is power. That um, we need to understand that power is manifest in many different ways. Uh, for example, class, gender, policing, violence, and so on. That all of these are the, the oppression of women, uh, oppression of, of, of uh, persons by class. These are ways of maintaining power and dominance over them. And that to understand the different theories of anarchism, uh, you have to understand the way in which uh, power gets played out. Uh, when we, and what happens is that a lot of Anarchists focus on the dimensions like class and gender um, to the, I think, mistake of ignoring the higher order construct, namely power. Hmm. If we believe that people are truly equal, then we need a world that reflects that kind, that reflects egalitarianism. I know of no political ideology that does this other than anarchism. People will talk about democracy but typically, democracy goes only so far. We need an anarchist world because we, we won't, I don't think we'll survive, both from a political or an, a political and economic or ecological standpoint.
unless we can deal with each other uh, in a manner that recognizes our uh, egalit that recognizes ourselves as being equal. And being equal means that we need to build organizations, build organizations which are non-hierarchical. Hierarchy is a form of manifestation power. And the worst form of hierarchy is, of course, bureaucracies. You know, anarchism probably had some of its roots uh, in, demo in democratic theory. Well, but if you're going to have a society in which a minority, uh, well, I'm sorry, in which a majority can determine uh, the relations of people and institutions, uh, that means that somebody's going to be on top and somebody's going to be on the bottom. Uh, and that is antithetical to the notions of, of anarchism. The, uh, whether we're talking about the economy and building a participatory economy as opposed to building a capitalist economy, whether we're talking about voting for somebody for political office as opposed to uh, a collective decision and collective decision making. Democracy simply is still a ma way uh, of maintaining power and hierarchy. We need to look at the mechanisms by which people maintain power and control over others. I think that possibly the most violent institutional form is a bureaucracy. Uh, it's violent because it legitimates uh, hierarchy. It's violent because um, it tells people that they're not responsible for their actions. That is to say, one acts in a bureaucracy according to the rules of the bureaucracy. But the rules of bureaucracy are ones which say, listen, um, you're not accountable for this. This is the way we do things. So one of the things that happens is that people get socialized into actions and mechanisms uh, which maintain the power base in the society. Now, it also comes about with respect to maintaining levels of discrimination, particularly where race and ethnicity and gender are involved. Discrimination, I would say, uh, and I, I've tried to persuade my sociological colleagues, discrimination uh, is the underlying basis of ethnoviolence. Stop there. Something like anarchism and violence question. I think that when it comes to violence, anarchists are divided. And I think that's okay. We don't have all the answers. Um, what we need, I think, as we build an anarchist theory is a sketch. Let's not pretend that we have a full-blown theory. We have a sketch of a theory. Sooner or later, uh, as uh, a population engages in insurrectionary activities, um, they move, in some cases, to violence. But um, was the Egyptian revolution we just witnessed violent? What well, many people are pointing to it as a nonviolent revolution, but um, both the police, the military, and certainly the protesters um, 
were doing things that were violent. So I say what we need to do is to minimize as much as we can the exercise of violence um, and understand that that has to be the absolute last resort. We can't build a peaceable society on the basis of a violent revolution. I just don't think that can happen. On the other hand, how we go about building a society of, of people at peace um, is something that we have to work at and work at, I think, very hard. Well, the first principle, I think, for anarchists um, is a principle of egalitarianism. Uh, we have to uh, be able to build institutions in which hierarchy and hierarchy and the maldistribution of power are central to uh, organizing. I think that we need to learn how to live and work collectively. And that collective work is one of the principles that is subsumed under power. That is, once we can uh, minimize, reduce, do away with power differentials, I think we can live a different kind of life. I think, and excuse me if I'm just sort of random, but this is a tough question. Um, I think we need to be able to deal with our technology differently. That is to say, we need to build, as, as Murray Bookchin put it, a liberatory technology. Um, so, for example, um, wind power or solar uh, may be construed as a liberatory technology, whereas um, fossil fuel burning plants require um, a high degree of concentration of uh, dealing with uh, with resources which won't last uh, oil coal for example particularly oil um, and nuclear power which is now being pushed once again uh, even at the level of the presidency of the united states um, nuclear power is a, a centralizing uh, form of energy uh, and that so we need to work on that. We need to work on dealing economically and to developing a kind of participatory uh, economics in which the people who are affected by economic decisions have a legitimate role in helping to make those decisions. It, it, we, we probably need to work hard at building um, we probably need to work hard at building egalitarian institutions. Uh, I don't think um, I have a, a poster upstairs I don't have it down here that says uh, uh, there can't be a revolution. Uh, without um, without women, or as Mao put it, <laughs> quoting Mao in an anarchist documentary, as Mao put it, uh, women hold up half the sky. I think the uh, we need to be able to. deal with race and ethnicity in a manner that we haven't yet been able to do. Just a 
often when talking about race, ethnicity, and so on, people say, that's the way we were born, that um, prejudice is an inborn characteristic. And I think they say that, and this is where social science and anarchism intersect. I, I think they say that because children learn so early the basic dimensions of race and ethnicity that by the age of three, children in most Western societies already have learned some of the basic stereotypes. So it comes so early, it deludes us into thinking uh, that it is almost instinctive. And of course, at one time it was uh, believed to be instinctive. Now it's uh, a, little, a little iffy. How it impacts on anarchism particularly is the fact that even as anarchists, we can't escape the fact that we live in a racist society. And so everything we do is colored by the fact that at the one time we act out a stereotype and at another time we act out with due diligence um, an egalitarian social form. We have to work at, and, and we, have, we have to work at fighting against racism, prejudice, bigotry, however you want to label it. And I think that one of the ways we do it, and I guess in part this is a principle of anarchist organization, we need to have systems of internal education. That is, for an anarchist organization to really survive, um, they've got to be able to come together at regular intervals uh, and literally have not necessarily an alternative school, although that would be great, uh, but literally have uh, a regular time and place in the everyday activities of the organization in which one acts out in an egalitarian, non-racist, non non-sexist manner. And I think that the failure of many groups, including anarchist groups, to maintain themselves together is the fact that they have not been able to um, educate themselves, if you will, um, as to the, the basic principles of anarchism. Take, for example, something like a food co-op. Uh, you can bring people together, uh, and anarchists have been involved in food co-ops and other alternative institutions. You can bring people together uh, and have them purchase food more cheaply. Uh, you can bring people together and have them purchase f more nutritious food. But unless there is also an understanding of the whole process of the growing of food, of the processing of food, uh, of uh, the way in which uh, food is distributed around the world, um, that unless you can have that, there's no politics here. And, and in that regard, anarchists have to maintain their politics up front. There are many different styles of anarchism. And I don't think that's bad. I would like to see greater cooperation um, than there is. But 
for example, the, the class war anarchists versus the anarchist syndicalists um, versus uh, the social anarchists and so on. All of these are different modes of expression uh, which are really trying to do the same thing, namely to build a society uh, based on uh, equality. It's seems to me many many different paths to an anarchist community. Uh, as long as um, we don't um, allow ourselves to fight with each other because we we've chosen a different path, and I think there's been a little bit of that um, in and coming from places where where they should have known better. That is, that is to say, um, I don't see why I can't live with an anarchist syndicalist, but I know they're wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't see why I can't uh, live with a class war anarchist, uh, but I think they're too Marxist. Uh, and so I have objections to all but my own variety of social anarchism. Uh, which I think is uh, the right path to take. But I certainly will not allow that to uh, assault uh, anarchists who, hold, who want to walk on a different path. Can you make a not anarchist syndicalist and more class struggle anarchism? I'm not exactly sure where the term social anarchism originated. I think it comes from a, an Italian work by Giovanni Baldelli um, in a book entitled Social Anarchism. We selected the name social anarchism. Uh, we spent a lot of time when we were starting up our magazine and we selected we had several choices. One was we thought of calling it broccoli. Uh, I'm serious. <laughs> we thought of calling it broccoli because nobody would know what what that meant, and that would give us the opening to talk about this. Uh, we thought of calling ourselves White Rose uh, because there was a collective at that time in Cambridge called the Black Rose, and a White Rose in Germany that uh, we decided, no, there were already too many roses there. Um, we had some other titles in mind, but we chose social anarchism uh, once, one time because um, it confused people. That is, it went, the notion of social anarchism uh, went against the stereotype of anarchism as violent and chaotic. And we figured that might make people talk, and, and it did, it does. To this day, when I tell people I'm a social anarchist, uh, they're ready to talk about it, and assuming uh, they don't walk away giggling. Um, I don't know of when people started using social anarchism uh, since we adopted it sort of from, from Baldelli. Uh, and this was, what, 1978, I think. Uh, so, and then when Murray Bookchin came out with his book on social anarchism, uh, it had nothing really to do with social anarchism, uh, but it popularized among anarchists, it popularized uh, the term. One of the central mechanisms we have not yet talked about is that of the alternative institution. The alternative, in, by an alternative institution, I mean some institution that deals with the vital resource, that operates under principles of uh, 
of non-hierarchy, anti-authoritarianism, if you will, uh, that has a process of internal education, and that these put together uh, participatory decision making on, on all of the, the issues that um, are important to the group you're working with, and in opposition to uh, the straight, narrow, capitalist group presumably you're opposed to, uh, the, uh, put them all together and you have an entirely different form of organization. And it's that organization that I think is one of the central to uh, building a revolutionary transfer culture. That is, uh, a transfer culture in the sense of raising the question, how do we get from here to there? And building alternative institutions, I argue, is one of those ways that we get from here to there. Great. The response to critics of anarchism who believe that somehow or other hierarchy and violence are part of human nature. It, the response is twofold. One is that it um, there's no evidence for that. That is to say, um, anything that you can point to and say this is part of human nature, I can point to its contradiction. So that um, human nature becomes uh, an ideological tool. I can attack you because you're violating principles of human nature, and you can attack me because I don't know what I'm talking about when I say uh, human nature uh, is basically good. That human nature uh, is a function of the way in which we raise our children. It's a function of the way in which we treat each other. Um, and it's a level of abstraction. I, I hate to get caught up in Okay, okay well... Well, I don't want to answer a question about how optimistic or pessimistic I am um, because it depends on what day it is. Um, but I also um, am willing to say that I don't want to think in terms of building a world on anarchist principles. I'd like to start out by thinking of building an alternative institutions, by building a community by building a network of workers in the same area. In other words, um, I, I want something more modest as a goal uh, than uh, um, the world in which everybody is wonderful. And furthermore, I have a feeling that if we were able to build an anarchist community, we would discover all kinds of things that we didn't think of before. Uh, and so we would still be building an anarchist community that, in fact, maybe there's no end to that. <laughs>